Welcome to the Rebel Souls Podcast, where we flip the middle finger to the status quo. I'm your host, Shelly Paxton, lifelong rebel, liberator of souls, and author of Soulbatical, a corporate rebel's guide to finding your best life. Settle in as we dive deep with badass leaders who are rebelling for what matters most in life, business, and the world at large. I'm so happy you're here. Let's get this revolution started. Before we begin, I want to share an offering from my soul to yours. If you've achieved traditional success only to realize that you're living someone else's dream, then this will start you on a profound journey toward becoming chief soul officer of your own life, just like I did. I'm gifting you a free chapter from my book, Soulbatical, A Corporate Rebel's Guide to Finding Your Best Life. It's called Liberating from the Shackles of Should. And if you're ready to, then visit soulbatical.com to download it for free. That's S-O-U-L-B-B-A-T-I-C-A-L dot com. Warning, side effects include intense joy and fulfillment. Hello and welcome back, my fellow rebel souls. This is your OG rebel soul and host, Shelly Paxton. It's so good to be here with you. I love our time together and I'm so grateful that you're tuning in and that our community is growing. And today we are taking a deep dive into a topic that the world needs a whole lot more of, deep kindness. And there is no one better to go on this journey with than Houston Craft. He is the advocate for kindness. He's a speaker, an author. He's the co-founder of Character Strong, which is teaches curriculum and trainings um, that are around social and emotional skills to students and teachers, basically equipping them with the tools to really... Uh, you know, practice and build muscle around kindness and compassion and empathy and connection and all these, this beautiful emotional intelligence that a lot of us weren't raised with. A lot of us are still figuring out in, in our adult years, in our late adult years. I'm raising my hand on this one. This is stuff I've, you know, just been practicing over the last decade. And as I've gotten deeper into coaching work, really gotten deeper into the practice of this work. And Houston's in his early 30s, and he has been an advocate for this since he was in high school and meeting the co-founder of Character Strong um, when he came and, and gave a lecture on leadership that rocked Houston's world and made him think completely differently about what leadership means. And he's now on this mission to help us really completely shift our mindset on what true kindness is. And that's what he calls deep kindness. You know, the kind that is empathetic, the kind that is connecting, the kind that is resilient, the kind that is vulnerable, so many things that we talk about. It's really powerful. Um, Houston and I met, I call him a new friend, an old soul and a fellow author, because we met um, through our shared uh, publishing imprint, Tiller Press, which is part of Simon & Schuster. And Houston's book, Deep Kindness, it's called Deep Kindness, a revolutionary guide for the way we think, talk, and act in kindness. Just came out at the end of September, and I was invited to be a part of this amazing event that he did around the launch of his book. I mean, you guys, this guy is always in service. He lives and breathes what he preaches in the world, and you can tell he's practicing it every day. And he gives us some great tips as to how to do that and how to make little changes in our own lives. And uh, anyway, he he hosted this launch event called Kindness Conversations Conference. 
And I was invited as one of the people that he had a 20 minute conversation with. And we totally hit it off. We were talking about the intersection of our work of sabbatical and kindness. And yeah, there's, there's a lot there to mine. And we do a little bit in this conversation as well. But at that point, I knew I needed to one, read the book, And then once I read the book, I knew I needed to have many more conversations with him. And so this is the start of many more conversations, inviting him to be a part of this podcast so I can share him with all of you because he's somebody you must know. And kindness is a conversation we must have. And he's helping us to understand how do we even understand it and articulate it and practice it and spread it in a way that is deep, not sort of this, what he calls common or confetti kindness that we're, you know, that we're, we're taught sort of the free and easy kindness, but this is the deep vulnerable kind of kindness, um, yeah, that that we need to normalize. And that's the mission that he's on is to help us get more comfortable with practicing it. And so we can normalize it in this world. And you guys, we need this more than ever in the very, very divided world and nation that we live in today. So I can't think of a better time to be having this conversation. Um, A little bit about Houston. I've already said some of this, but he's a speaker, author, and yes, kindness advocate. He's the co-founder of Character Strong, which is a, um, it's an organization that It builds curriculum and trainings that help teach social and emotional skills, like emotional intelligence, think, you know, resilience, think compassion, think kindness and connection, the things we've been talking about. And he's, he's served over 2 million students globally, teaching and speaking and really helping them understand that kindness can change their lives and change other people's lives. And it's, um, yeah, it's really powerful what he, what he does. And he's such an embodiment of it. It's a joy to listen. I'm in awe and super inspired by who he is in the world and how he shows up. And so I love the book. It's an easy read and a super practical guide. So we get into a little bit of what does that even look like? And the stories he tells are just like, they will like pierce your heart. And a lot of them are deeply personal stories of his lived experience and how he's learned to practice kindness, how he's learned to embrace kindness firsthand and how honestly, how his mom in particular, but both his mom and dad have been his role models and mentors for kindness in his life. And I'm not going to spoil it by telling you guys the story, but we talk about it. And it's just, yeah, I mean, I'll give you one little thing. He talks about his mom as his hero and says his best life lesson that she taught him is to hug like you mean it. Whew. Like hug like you mean it. I know we're sitting here in the midst of a pandemic and we can't hug anyone outside of whoever's living in our little bubble at the moment. But you guys, like that to me says everything. And how can we convey a hug without being able to physically hug? And he's teaching us some of those those tricks and tools, both for ourselves and for others so that we can spread this in the world and we can start to shift culture at a time where we need it the most. So I'm going to leave you there. Um, The only little housekeeping tip I have is that we have no video. So for those of you who love to watch us in action on YouTube, Sadly, we don't have video for this one. Um, We had to do this in two parts. We started the conversation while I was in Baja, Mexico, but no bueno. The Mexican Wi-Fi was a little fickle when an owl sits on a line or the wind blows the wrong way. Yeah. 
the Wi-Fi goes down and ultimately the quality of the conversation was so bad and the internet just finally crashed. So we did this in two parts. I have an incredible podcast production team. So it's likely that you might not even notice it, but just in case you do, it's been a little stitched together. And that's the reason why you're not getting video for this one, which is very sad because it was a fun and very animated conversation. But I think you'll get that from our um, from our voices and from the, the um, energy in the conversation. That's the, yeah, that's the story. It was, um, it was an honor to have him and he practiced deep kindness and really understanding and appreciating and being in it with me as we were having lots of technical challenges and picking ourselves back up and finishing this puppy off so we could bring it to you guys. So please enjoy the conversation and practice deep kindness in your lives. Let's all do this together. All right. Love you, Rebel Souls. Let's dive in. Forget that most mm -hmm. important piece and make you do this over Every again. Um, I do my intros separately. So I'll do it after you and I have the conversation. So we don't have to worry about that stuff. Um, and then I can right. just plug like a little bit about the conversation. So um, we can dive in. Um, also, awesome. let's see. Do you have any questions on your end? No, is the sound, you want me on full mic or is the sound okay? The sound is great, actually. How okay. is the sound on my end? You sound great too. We're okay, both sound perfect. great today. I did, I did woot, woot. What's a good sound day? It's like, I'm having a very bad hair day, which is why like it's humid out. So I'm like put, putting the thing on. So, you know, I'll take bad hair <laughs> good. day, good sound day. That's a good combo. <laughs> For a podcast, um, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Well, this one, I do record the video, but honestly, most people download it and listen to the audio. So I don't worry too yeah. much about it. I was like, I'm not going to fuss around with the background. It looks good enough. It um, yeah, that's great. The other, well, the only other thing I wanted to mention is I do start with the question, what are you rebelling for? So, yeah. you know, then it's just a launching pad to then unpack the rest of our conversation. So just know that after I kind of say hi, whatever, I'll ask you what you're rebelling for. And then we can see organically where the conversation takes us. Yeah. Great. Does that sound good? Thanks yes. again, by the way, for inviting me onto your KCC. That was super, super fun. I love that you're you did so that. You're so welcome. Uh, yeah, it was so that was such a good day and okay, well, I, will please, I was gonna say please tell me you slept for like a whole day after doing that 13 hour marathon no i had a like a 550 on camera news interview the next morning that oh my God. pr agency had put together i was like how dare you <laughs> yeah exactly like oh my god but i did go to bed at like 8 p.m or whatever it was yeah so yeah. Holy shit. That's a lot. Well, good. I'm glad that you're like, people are eating it up though. You're on a mission yeah. and I want to talk about that mission. So yeah. I also, I have some notes on my phone just cause I'm, you know, down here without printers and whatever, which is actually good. Right. I'm not killing more trees. So <laughs> yeah. that all, that all feels good. All right, let's do, I've got us here. I'm on record. All right. I'll just do a quick countdown and then let's just keep this conversation going. We've got a good, we got a good banter. I like a good yes. banter. <laughs> All right. uh, by the way, I have to tell you this. There's a guy here, Addison. Shit. I'm going to forget his last name. Um, have you heard of a men's mental health app called tether? It's fairly new. Yeah. No, it sounds Brilliant. Good, yeah. One of the co-founders is actually here with me, right? Or not with me, but we are all Hello. here together as part of the group. He's amazing. He's about the same age in LA. Um, huh. And I told him, I was like, you guys, I just have a sense need to be connected because they're doing really cool shit in the world. So I'll send you a separate email linking the two of you up. Awesome. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Now we'll do the official like rock and roll. Get in on this thing. All right. I'll do three, two one. Hey, so excited for this conversation. Rebel Souls, welcome Houston Craft. How you doing, Houston? Oh, not as good as you're doing right now, it seems like. <laughs> I know. So, so for those of you who are not watching, you won't notice, but I'm in a very different location. And I was just saying slash bragging to Houston that I've been down in Baja, Mexico for two and a half weeks. And I'm going to be here for another week and a half. And I kind of might not want to go home until this COVID thing dies down. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, if you leave, I'll take your spot. So yeah. How about that? <laughs> okay. All right. We got a deal. I know I have to go home at some point or at least have to go visit my parents for Christmas. So we'll see how that pans <laughs> out, but I'm so excited to have you with me. So I, for anybody who follows me on social, you know, I was part of this beautiful event called kindness conversations conference, which was scheduled by or hosted by Houston for the launch of his book called Deep Kindness, which I know is going to be one of the things we dig in deep. And for those of you who are watching the video, here it is. You cannot miss this bright yellow. <laughs> yeah. This is like a ray of sunshine and positivity. And I felt mm. the same way reading the book. Like they're, it's beautiful. So I want to, I want to dive into that. So that was, um, Houston and I are actually published by the same imprint at Simon and Schuster Tiller Press. And we got connected that way. And I was so honored to be a part of the event that you hosted for the launch of your book. And I'm super excited to have you back to dig in a little deeper than 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. My, how the tables have turned. This is good. I was asking you there the questions go. last time. <laughs> I know. Now you're on the hot seat. Ooh, this is going to be fun. All right. So you know how I start every conversation. I'm going to ask you, what are you rebelling for? Uh, I'm rebelling for a broken education system that offers a narrow laned definition of success. And uh, what I want to change, what I want to disrupt, what I want to break, what I want to rebel for is to create uh, a pathway uh, towards achievement that involves uh, self-care as well as um, compassion. I love it. And deep kindness has got to be a part of that, right? Part of the equation. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I'm disrupting. I'm rebelling to get deep kindness in every school library. That's That'll be a mini goal. I love it. I love it. And so I do, I want to dig into like how you got into this work. Cause I'm so fascinated. You're the co-founder of an organization called character strong. So from what I understand, you guys go into schools, you work with kids of all ages and you're teaching, what do you say? Do you say social and emotional intelligence? Is that how you describe it? And can you tell us a little bit more about like, what does that mean? And what does that work look like? Yeah. Yeah, the, the term is, is held loosely. I actually learned the, the history of the term social emotional learning a few years ago. Uh, it is really sort of originated by um, Daniel Goleman, who wrote the book Emotional Intelligence, and uh, Tim Shriver, Dr. Tim Shriver. And they both came from very different educational backgrounds, and they were arguing with each other what students needed more. And uh, one of them said they needed social skills. The other one said they needed emotional skills. And they said, well, why don't we compromise and call it social and emotional learning, which is to say, what are the things outside of academics that are gonna make people feel fulfilled and successful in their life? And uh, it's only like, in many ways, a 25 year old quote unquote industry, but that's the line of work we're in is supporting schools to teach that social emotional category uh, for students and for adults, who turns yeah. out typically need it more than the students. Um, but obviously, in the context of COVID, a lot of those needs have only been amplified. So we've just revealed wow, we have such a shortage in terms of stress and coping and resilience skills uh, and such a need for connection and community. And so, yeah, one, one tweak to how you framed it that I would offer is we provide tools for educators to build those connections and teach those things because... We know, uh, the research tells us that one of the highest impact sizes um, in education in terms of its uh, impact on student learning is going to be the teacher-student relationship. And it's uh, like 60% of kids that would say they don't have any meaningful relationship in a school. It's oh, wow. frustratingly high. And so our goal is to provide the tools for teachers to support that relationship building and after that trust and buy-in is created, then teach them all the other skills necessary to live a hopefully successful, meaningful life. I, I love, I just, I applaud that you're advocating for this because I wish we would have learned those skills. You know, I just wrote a book called Soulbatical because I didn't figure this out until I was 46 freaking years old. <laughs> yeah, right? wouldn't it be better at 14? Hello. Yeah. yeah. So I really like, as I was, as I've gotten to know you, as I've read about the mission that you're on, as I was reading your book, Deep Kindness, I was like, 
man, oh man, you're right. We are not well equipped. And so we as adults have a hard time being role models for the next generations. So I love that you're starting there. So not only can kids learn, they're well equipped and they can become better role models for future generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, education is the the most long-term, uh, I think, solution to culture change in our world, right? The things, yeah. the behaviors we teach today are, is going to be the culture we experience tomorrow. So it's a long play, but I'm That's, in it. Yeah, I love that. The long game. I mean, well life is the long game, right? <laughs> so that's a beautiful way to frame it, hopefully. Um, I want so okay, I want to talk about how you got into this work. And then I know as we get into your book, we'll probably unpack a little bit more about what this work looks like, because it sounds grand. It's like, oh my God, resilience and kindness and compassion. It's like, those things can often sound lofty. And it's like, I don't even know where to start. So I would love to unpack a little bit of that. Uh-oh, did you freeze on me? Oh, there you go. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, we're back. <laughs> we have okay, good. Momentary pause. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to unpack a little bit of like, what does that look like? And what got you into this work? Was it like you were just seeing that we were, you know, that we were sort of headed down this deep, dark rabbit hole of disconnection? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, I think my number one pathway into this work is now the person I get to do work with, which is a guy named John Norlin, mm. who I saw him speak at a high school leadership camp going into my senior year of high school. So he was one of the senior counselors. He was a keynote speaker one night where he told his story. And uh, so much of the leadership was paradigm shifting for me. And probably the biggest thing that I walked away with was that leadership wasn't a position or a title that leadership was was mainly contingent on our willingness and capacity to serve. And as someone who was elected to be student body president in my high school, I had all these narratives in my head, partially because of personal experience, but also like what culture told me leadership was, that got totally flipped on their head at this camp, where John talked a lot about leadership being is that consistent things that we do in small ways every day to meet people's legitimate needs. That was oftentimes about kindness or compassion or connection. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the hard work actually of leadership. Um, they made distinctions like you don't, leadership is not management, right? You manage things, you lead people and the leading of the people piece is the much more complicated work oftentimes. And I remember being in high school and having so many of these like paradigm shift in my mind that I went back into my senior year with a totally different game plan than I think I intended originally. And at the beginning of the year, my senior year of high school, I just got together with a group of, of students and friends and said, let's create an organization at school where once a week, our entire purpose is to focus on connection. Uh, we called it random acts of kindness, et cetera. And once a week we would get together to basically protect time to practice kindness. Greed was important, but when we get busy and into the day-to-day, -day, it becomes a lot harder to put it into action. And so from listening to John to actually like trying to put the message or these ideas into practice my senior year, it, I mean, that changed the whole trajectory of my life, which to me, fast forwarding a bit to like the book and the, the premise of it is like, think about the power of how changing how a word shows up to you. Right, changing your perspective or your paradigm of what something is, even just like the definition of a word in your brain, how much that can shape the outcomes that exist in your life. Um, that happened to me with the idea of leadership. And as I've done this work around compassion and connection and kindness for the past decade, that's what I want to turn around and offer in some ways. Of what if we thought about kindness, for example, differently than how our culture has presented to it, it to us over and over and over again? Uh, so that's like the short version of the origin story. If I were to pin it back to a moment, it was sitting there, 17 year old kid going into his senior wow. year being like, what does it mean to lead? 
And you're right. And I love how I now see the influence and how you carried that, how you carry it through your work. And as I was reading the book, I now sort of understand like, oh, because everything sounded like it seemed like a mindset shift. And that's an area where I live mm -hmm. every day as a coach and as somebody who is really yeah. an advocate for living and leading more authentically, courageously, and purposefully. And what was so, I literally, what gave me goosebumps as I was reading the book is how a aligned our missions are and it was really beautiful we're, we're speaking in different language but so much of it is about the intention and the reframing and the commitment and that mm. I thought that was really beautiful how I was like oh this is going to be interesting digging into kindness and then I'm like holy shit we say so much of the same stuff. We're talking about purpose. We're talking about busyness. We're talking about overwhelm. We're talking about all these things that are standing in our way. Mm. Yeah, I loved that. Yeah. Just uh, different lanes of the same road, for sure. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So well, let's talk about, um, let's talk about, I want to understand how you got to the point of writing this book. And then I want to dive into the book. I'm super curious because you've clearly had these amazing role models in your life. So you mentioned John and now you guys are in partnership around this business and you've influenced, I mean, probably tens of thousands, if not more kids with character strong. And it sounds like your mom was a pretty inf big influence from what or is a pretty big influence from what I picked up on in the book has she been one who's also been encouraging this journey yeah both my parents are uh relentless supporters which yeah. has been so good uh the, the the pros of being an only child is like deep investment from both parents yeah i don't think my dad has ever hung up the phone without saying i'm proud of you it's like a uh, i think makes a point of it mm. um or you know even if it's a short conversation it'll always be oh good job good job, proud of you, you know, something real quick. Uh, and my mom is just like such an embodiment of compassion and someone who I've learned through just the role modeling she's given me. Um, one of the stories I talk about a little bit in the book is that she wrote a note in my lunchbox, basically like kindergarten through 12th grade every day, right? It was a small post-it note, but it always had like a word of encouragement or a word of the day or a quote. And I talk about that like consistency over time is to me a more profound action of love than the one big event or huge fundraiser that you pull off, right? It's like the aggregate of the two to three minute things that you do with discipline and intention daily that mean the most. So yeah, I'm lucky, so lucky because I've been surrounded by so many mentors who just live the live what I now try to live really well. Well, and you're carrying the torch in such a beautiful way. I was reading this going, oh my God, love your mom. Like the story about the post-its. I just, mm -hmm. I, it, I think that's so cool. And I can imagine I went back to sort of my young self and I'm like, oh my God, I would have been rolling my eyes. And now that I do what I do in the world and I have such an appreciation for it, I'm like, why aren't we all doing things like that? Because as you say in the book, it builds trust. That consistency, knowing that somebody is going to show up again and again and again for you builds a trust that is kind of sorely lacking. And I think it sounds like is a big driver in why we don't have deep connection and deep kindness. Yeah, I think we take for granted uh, so many of us. Kindness has been a precursor to pain. Mm. Someone has offered us kindness and then perhaps the day later or six months later, taking it away. Or that might be the perception of how it happened. Either way, we consciously or unconsciously begin to associate generosity or connection or kindness with, with hurt, pain, which means as we get older, it becomes harder for some of us to accept kindness uh, because we're fearful uh, of yeah. what's on the far side of it. And to me, that's one of the... Uh, decisions I try to offer in the book of you know, so often we'll try to give something and if we feel rejected in return we take it quite personally uh, yes. because we're we're expecting something we want gratitude we want it to work especially for well intention but the reality is people can't receive something they don't trust and so if we haven't done the hard background work of building that trust ahead of our action 
or if we haven't done the humble work to say, it's okay that you don't receive my kindness the first time, I'll come back again. Because even though it's painful to feel rejected, my momentary feeling of pain and this rejection is smaller than my desire to connect and do good for you. Uh, and so I'm going to keep coming back. Yeah, I love it. You say, I, I wrote down this quote, you said, deep kindness asks us to dream so vividly big that the risks feel manageable when compared to the good that is possible on the other side of our action. And I just sat hmm. with that, like that is powerful because it's like what you talked about, right? Because deep kindness is scary and it's vulnerable. And yeah. you talk about that vulnerability. Can you dig into that a little bit more for us? Like maybe let's start with how do you even distinguish deep kindness from, you know, what you call common kindness and confetti kindness in the book, but this kind of surface level kindness that so many of us have been trained in, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Again, language drives so much of our, of our action. And uh, I've spent time, you know, bulk of my early career was speaking in schools. And so I, I spoke at 600 schools over the course of about seven years. And wow. I would say 98% of them um, had kindness as a part of their motto or their mission statement or their, you know, their ac clever acronyms of like what we're about at this school. And I think there's an unintentional danger in saying this is what we believe in without the proper training that lives beneath it. Because I go to a lot of these schools and you see there's like posters up on the wall yeah. to inspire action. And one of the most common posters, and, and uh, to your point of what I mentioned in the book, I talked about the difference between confetti kindness and deep kindness, because one of the posters I saw most frequently said, throw kindness around like confetti, <laughs> which maybe you've seen it before in a hallway or on Pinterest or on social media. And I, I get the intention of it. And I think most of us would understand the spirit of it, which is just to say, we need more kindness in the world. Give it more gently. The unintended danger of it, I think, is that we begin to cheapen the thing. Mm -hmm. We begin to associate with something as simple or as easy or as free as confetti. And my argument, of course, would be if kindness was as simple or as easy as tossing confetti around, well, the world would be a much more compassionate kumbaya place. And it's not, because the real work of kindness is quite a bit more uncomfortable. In fact, I would argue one of the most damaging narratives in our culture, the idea that kindness is free. But kindness is this commonplace thing, that kindness is just this sweetness. And I hear people, people who are frustrated with the state of the world lament often, like, why are people more kind? Just be kind to each other. And it's like, well, because it requires vulnerability. Because it requires oftentimes sacrifice. Because it requires discipline to prioritize your time in order to orient your schedule towards selflessness and not selfishness. Right? And those are things that challenge our typical narrative of kindness, I believe. Confetti kindness, I would describe as the things that see celebrated on the news, like the pay it forward coffee lines, the right. random acts of kindness, which don't get me wrong. Like, I don't think for the most part, anything's inherently wrong with them. I would just argue that those sorts of kindnesses don't move the cultural needle forward. Yeah. Deep kindness, the kind that is a bit more self-reflective, self-confrontational, requires a bit more inconvenience and discomfort, humility, vulnerability. Those are the sorts of acts I think we need to prepare ourselves to engage with if we're ever going to actually make a full measurable difference in our culture. Uh, and so that's what the book tries to spend most of its time unpacking is what does that actually look like? And to your point, uh, it looks like deciding that kindness is so monumentally important that the that, that disposition toward doing good for others or the common good is so big that in spite of fear or overwhelm or anxiety, I'm going to choose it anyways. The work I offer in the book is, is your fight bigger than your feelings? Is what you're fighting for so clearly larger than you that even when you don't feel like doing it, you will choose to align yourself to it anyways. I love that. By the way, I have to comment that one of the things, other things we have in common is alliteration. 
I just, I love like the <laughs> fight over feelings and you had, I think, purpose over productivity and so many other beautiful ways to frame how we can shift that or at least start to shift that paradigm and our own thinking <laughs> toward that, yeah. toward that bigger game. So that also got me because I was like, oh yeah, yeah, he writes like I write. That's fun. It's really, and it, and it makes it really memorable. It's a cheap trick, but I'm going to keep performing it. <laughs> oh, amen, brother. So am I. We're going to be like, we're, we're going to stay in that lane together. So one of the stories, I, I mean, let's be honest. I loved every story from how you started the book with Helga to set up the concept of mm. let's make kindness normal because it's not on the deep level that you're talking about and in the, you know, in the culture shifting way that you're talking about. And there's so many beautiful stories. Like you were really vulnerable in the way that you told so many stories about your own life and your own marriage falling apart and so many different things. And you told this beautiful story of your first trip to Haiti. And one of the things that you spelled out that mm. literally gave me goosebumps and pause was through this story, you helped us to understand the difference between apathy, sympathy, and empathy. And empathy is at the core of deep kindness from what I took away. Can you share a little bit more about that yeah. Haiti story and then how you think about those three things? Because that really brought it home for me. Mm. Yeah, empathy is one of those as my friend Barbara says, empathy gives kindness. Why? Because in cultivating a uh, really a skill set of understanding what other people are experiencing and understanding as a result what people need, hmm. kindness then is the action of meeting those needs. But sometimes we kindness that is self-serving, right? Kindness without empathy is typically self-serving kindness. Uh, the example that I, I use in the book that um, I, I think is my favorite sort of clear, small example of the entire <laughs> book itself is this Sandy Hook and the shooting that happened in Connecticut, which is this moment of pain where now we have this response of, okay, now that something is, um, or someone is in pain, now it's time for kindness. My own issue is with, right? We're more reactive than we are. But here's this moment collectively where the world tries to respond with kindness. And so people all over the world sent teddy bears, stuffed animals, uh, to show kindness for this community in pain. So many stuffed animals, in fact, the town had to re thousand square to house all the animals. The person that ran the candlelit vision that there were more teddy bears present than there were people. And in a really profound statement, he goes, you know, a stuffed animal is great. The teddy bear doesn't pay for counseling and a teddy bear doesn't pay for a funeral. Whew, that lands. And I thought to myself, how many times have I given something that made me feel good, but I never really ask you just what you need? Right. so who gets to win in this situation? The person who's actively in pain or the person who gets to celebrate themselves for being kind in the moment? And that's where confetti kindness um, can actually be dangerous and sometimes do more harm than good. Because now you're creating a logistic problem to a community already suffering a huge uh, loss and, and trauma. And so I, I have to say this, empathy is uh, right, the, it's the for for break the action that informs our decisions if we choose to make them and how we treat another our group of people. I tell the story of Haiti, which in its Shortest version, um, I got an experience, probably the most visceral perspective of need, pain that I've been exposed to in my life yet at that point. And I remember uh, so clearly going down into Port-au-Prince, a group of um, basically seven to eight-year-old kids who were part of this choir called Ozo. Wozo and Haitian Creole mean bamboo. They're mod bend, but we do not break it. Mm. And they prepare for so long for this of sing down in the capital. It was a really big deal. They all traveled down together, got there finally, and their set got cut in half. It was sort of a logistical nightmare to arrive there, be there, and for, finally they got up on stage and they sang. 
And then it was time to go home. And uh, as we're packing up to leave, a storm is rolling in. And in Haiti, storms are not light. You know, it's not the gentle sprinkle that I grew up with in, in Seattle, the perpetual gray. It's like an aggressive, uh, like hose on full power kind of thing. And so we're piling into the car and we're driving and it's an hour drive and the thunder is literally inside of our seats. And some of the kids are in the dying and we have six schools in our car. We're supposed to pop off. Water management in Haiti is poor. So there's water like two feet up on the roof, flash flooding, people gathering their goods. And at this point it's dark and we are back in Bausia where the school uh, that my friend, friends now build exists. And I learned that for the six girls in the car, all of them at the least have to travel at least another mile as their homes aren't attached to well roads. So in the pouring rain, late at night, they're having to walk a mile or more. And each time we make a stop, John, my friend who started nonprofit Haiti Partners, he would get out of the car, he would walk to the back, open up the doors, he would let one girl out, walk him to a member, a brother, an aunt, a mom, a grandma, exchange some words, and he would hop back in the car. And by the end of the night, uh, John is soaking wet, like head to toe, through the bones, drenched. And we finally dropped off the last girl. And I said, John, you know, I'm so sorry that this did not go according to plan. <laughs> you know, like if this happened in the States, families were suing. This was a logistical nightmare. The weather was terrible. And he looked back at me with a big, like, joy smile on his face. And he goes, Houston, if I could, I would stand in the rain all night with those girls. Hmm. And I remember uh, having a pause here because I had just had the experience of logistically, none of this event went off correctly. <laughs> and yet John was so proud and described to me, you know, Houston, for many of these girls, this was the best of their life. And I remember thinking about distinction between empathy, sympathy, and, and empathy, which are things that I, I thought, but John crystallized it to me in a moment that apathy is, it's raining, I hope you don't get wet. Hmm. Apathy would be in the car and saying, at least I'm still dry. Sympathy is, here's an umbrella, good luck, which has its place. Empathy is standing in the rain and we'll never know the scope or depth of what many people in Haiti will experience over the course of their life. And I think I had this narrative in my brain for a long time that in order to have empathy for someone, you had to live their experience, right? You had to live it to like my time. Yes. And watching John get back in that car and feel so filled and so present to these girls, I realized that it's not always about attaching yourself directly to their storyline. It's about recognizing their storyline in your own. Because I know what it feels like to prepare for something important to me. I know what it feels like to have all these to go wrong. I know what it feels like to be soaking wet. And to be fully present to that person and to be with them in their suffering or their joy um, is empathy. And uh, that requires uh, presence and patience and a perspective um, and a lot of work. And I think more and more about my work, particularly in schools, the translation of that is how to teach people to take on the perspective of someone so far away from you. Because to turn the perspective of someone who looks like me or grew up like me or has the same skin color as me or beliefs as me, uh, is like is like reaching out to touch a new experience. Mm. But for some people with different physical needs or a different race or a different sexual identity or all these things that are far from me, that perspective leap is a, more substantial, requires more work. I call empathy intentional imagination. So it's a greater extent of my imagination into someone else's experience. And I think most of us, without the context, we settle for doing the thing that is most accessible to us, which is typically having empathy for those most like us. 
Uh, and so the real of kindness in this context is to figure out how different is someone else's needs based on perhaps the exact same experience or event happening in my life. How differently might they need something than I would in any given scenario? Uh, and that perspective thing, that exercise intentional imagination, that willingness to stand in the rain with someone uh, can inform the facts of this in our life. For to it's so it's so powerful, and I like that visual has stuck with me since hearing you first read that story and then reading it again as I was going through the book. So that feels like a perfect sort of opening or segue to talk a little bit more about, okay, so that crystallizes an example of what deep kindness looks like, standing in the rain together. That's one example. What does what else does deep kindness look like? I mean, you talk in the book, you, actually, you organize the book, I think, by what's getting in our way. You talk about our incompetence because we don't have the right tool set. You talk about our insecurity, which is, I think, probably related to vulnerability, right? And the difficulty of getting into that space. And you talk about inconvenience, right? Maybe it doesn't serve us, <laughs> So I'm really curious. One of my favorite parts of the book was the Haiti story. That landed deeply with me. Were you really helping us understand apathy versus sympathy versus empathy, which is a key ingredient to deep kindness? Can you take us through elements of that story and those ingredients and differentiate them for us? Yeah, first of all, I, I love the I love the analogy to kindness as a bit of a cookbook, right? There's a lot of ingredients that live beneath the end result, uh, much like Pinterest, where they have all these like beautiful pre presentations on the far side. It's always good to remember the trial and error, <laughs> the time, the energy, the ingredients that go before. And my friend Barbara Gruner says it, I think, best. She says, empathy gives kindness its why. And I would describe empathy as a skill that lives beneath the practice of kindness. I use that example, I frame it like that because I think it's such a critical ingredient. Um, one of the most profound stories I stumbled upon in, in writing the book, Shelley, was, was the story of Sandy Hook, a story that most people know about from its tragedy. But what most people don't know is uh, what happened on the far side of this pain, which is that people from all over the world wanted to do an act of kindness for a community in need. We could probably have a whole nother podcast about why we wait for bad stuff to happen until we practice doing good stuff, but for another time. For the purpose of this conversation, here's this tragic event. People from all over the world send stuffed animals, teddy bears, because they know that children have been killed in this event. So many stuffed animals, in fact, Shelley, that the town of Newtown, Connecticut, who's in the middle of dealing with this emotional trauma, now has to rent a 20,000 square foot warehouse to house all the inbound gifts. And the guy that ran the candlelit vigil has this really profound quote. He says, you know, a, a teddy bear is great, but a teddy bear doesn't pay for counseling and a teddy bear doesn't pay for a funeral. He shared that there were more teddy bears present at the candlelit vigil than there were people. And I remember reading that and, and thinking it was such a uh, practical and heartbreaking example of how even well-intentioned kindness, not informed by empathy, listening, understanding someone's need, that sort of kindness can actually serve me way more than the person I'm trying to give it to. People from all over the world got to feel good that they were doing something for a community in need, but we don't, uh, perhaps we didn't ask, is this what they actually need? Yeah, this was serving me versus them. Yeah, and I think that uh, sometimes we like to dismiss ourselves from the second half of that reflection question. <laughs> so, okay, I want to help. How do I help? And then am I helping in a way that is actually legitimately meeting someone's needs? I feel like I learned about this really profoundly in a visit to Haiti, uh, where I got to travel because um, one of my friends was building a school in a very poor area of Haiti called Bausia, about an hour outside of Port-au-Prince. And I had never been to a place like Haiti before. So I landed, I'm in my fedora. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I remember traveling the streets of Haiti and looking around at, at just visceral devastation. 
and, and Haiti is a place of, of contrast. You know, you see so much joy uh, sort of backgrounded by pain. And I remember traveling through the streets and, and seeing sort of firsthand um, a sense of poverty I'd never seen before in my life. And we got up to about an hour outside of Port-au-Prince to Baosia and pulled into my friend John's house. And uh, part of the project of Haiti Partners, which is the organization I was visiting and, and now I'm on the board of, uh, because I believe so deeply in their work, but you pull into their driveway and one of the projects they have is this choir called Wozo. Wozo in Haitian Creole means uh, bamboo. Their motto, which I love is we bend, but we do not break. I like to think about like resilience. What a, what a natural resource resilience is in a place like Haiti. And I remember pulling in and the choir singing and I have no idea what they're saying. I don't speak the language. But I remember it being just the most beautiful welcome. And I remember John's kids coming running out because they were so excited that only three days from then was the big event. And they talked about it for days and days, the big event, the big event, the big event. And I learned that the big event was uh, a, a festival hosted by Life is Good, the brand, down in Port-au-Prince. So finally, Saturday rolls around. It's the day of the big event. And they were so excited because Wozo was going to get to perform. So they show up at like 10 in the morning to get the bus. And we wait three hours for the bus to arrive. Oh, man. And it is so hot in Haiti. We're all just dripping sweat. And finally, the bus pulls in. And it's not a big charter bus like I was used to in high school. It's like a 12-passenger van to fit like 20-some-odd kids. And they travel the hour down to Port-au-Prince. They get there. They discover that the festival's running behind schedule. Their set time is now cut in half. They get changed into their outfits. They get up on stage. They sing their hearts out. It's beautiful. I don't know what they're saying, but it doesn't matter because it's gorgeous. And they get off stage, and in the distance, a storm is inbound. And I grew up a, a big portion of my life, Shelly, in Washington State, where rain is a persistent, gentle experience. Haiti is not that. Haiti is like, like suddenly you're beneath an ocean that has been upturned and it is aggressive. Mm. And so we're all sprinting to the cars and we realize that we can take six girls in the back of our SUV. And as we're traveling, water is like surging through the streets. Thunder is overhead. And at one point the thunder blasts and it's like inside the seats. And one of the little girls in the background who's like five starts crying. And I see, before I can even say anything, the rest of the girls reach out and grab her hand and they all start singing. It's one of the ways they helped each other soothe. We drive the hour and one by one, as it starts to become nighttime, John, who's driving, parks the car, gets out, helps a girl out of the back and walks them over to family members. And I learned that many of these young women have to walk another two miles, right? There's no roads directly to their homes. So it's pouring rain, it's late, and they're walking. And I remember the last kid finally getting out and John finally getting back in the car. And at this point, he is like a wet towel, like drenched to the bone. And we, me and Jesse, John's brother, we're all sitting there sort of laughing at how if this had happened in the U.S., there would be lawsuits. <laughs> we're not sure. as tough as we like to pretend to be. And I remember feeling so bad for John and, and putting my hand on his shoulder and saying, you know, I'm really sorry that the big event didn't go according to plan. And I'll never forget, he looks back and he goes, Houston, sitting right here, this is the big event. Because you don't understand, for many of these, these kids, this was the best day of their life. In spite of all the hurdles, the fact that they got to go up there and perform. And he goes, for me, if I could have, I would have stood all night in the rain with those girls. And I remember reflecting on, first of all, like just the attitude, the paradigm shift that I saw in John, a guy who's from the US, but has spent 25 years in Haiti trying to serve and, and serve a population that is desperately in need of people to come alongside them. And I remember thinking that this is to me such a visceral understanding of empathy in a way that I think so many of us like confuse the concept. You know, I think for a long time, I thought in order to have empathy for someone, I had to live their experience in order to give them comfort. I had to live it to give it was my like empathy paradigm. And I started thinking about the difference between empathy and a word like apathy, which to me, apathy is uh, as long as I'm not getting wet, <laughs> I'm okay. 
right? As I look at these girls like drenched underwater, as long as I'm not wet, I'm okay. Sympathy is the one that I think some of us naturally strive towards and, and maybe our most natural inclination towards service is, hey, here's an umbrella, hope it helps. Empathy, as I learned from John that night, is standing in the rain. Mm -hmm. It's being with, it is being alongside someone in their suffering. And I will never experience so many of the challenges that so many people in Haiti have had to navigate. But I do know what it feels like to feel frustrated that something I'd planned for didn't go perfectly according to plan. I know what it feels like to, uh, to be drenched, right? Or even to have the sensation of feeling overwhelmed and drenched. And sometimes, uh, as I would describe it, empathy is simply the practice of intentional imagination. It's imagining myself not into your circumstance, but into the feeling of your circumstance. Imagining myself into how your world might be affected by this thing and how might that be different from mine. And there's so much power in recognizing that what I need in a moment isn't always what you need. And perhaps the most meaningful first step we can take towards practical deep kindness is to listen first in order for us to love better. Whew. Listen first in order to love better so that we can stand in the rain together. Wow, that actually so almost a, rhymed too. That's powerful. Yeah, I should have just said it like that. So I don't know why. I've, my, no, I'm my, so long my job is no, no, no. That's so. That's so. I'm just reflecting on what you said, and I was like, oh man, like let's all just like, if for anybody listening to this, like hit the rewind button, like go back to 15 or 30 seconds and just listen to that again. So here's my question, right? So we know this. I think intellectually we understand it. And yet like what gets in our way of practicing standing in the rain together? What gets in our way? Why is it so hard sometimes? Is it just that we're not trained? Like we weren't brought up this way? What is it? Yeah, I think it's a combination of things that are working against us. And I think the question what gets in the way is certainly more interesting than do I believe in this thing? Mm. Because the, the, that's the low-hanging fruit, is it not? Do I believe in kindness? Yeah. Uh, does, that, does that question whether or not I'm capable of it, how often I practice it, my depth of my commitment to it, does it recognize that I have a lot of gaps or shortcomings when it comes to that practice? To me, the more interesting question will always be, what prevents me from the most kind version of myself? To identify gaps is the first step in even being able to close them. So for me, as, as I think about that question, I... I I think about it in my own personal framework of uh, incompetence, insecurity, and inconvenience. And I think there's things that fall under all three of those categories, but to give real short summaries for each, when it comes to kindness, one of my barriers is incompetence, meaning I think there are some tools that are not in my toolbox, whether because of lived experience, whether because of a failure of the education system, or whether because of my own lack of ambition or discipline to learn some of these things, I think there are some skills that live beneath the external behavior of kindness. That if I don't have them, let's take empathy as a great example. If I don't feel, um, if I haven't cultivated the skill of conscious or patient listening, right? Empathy is something I still have work. It's still a competency I can grow a lot in. If sometimes I'm scared or nervous to tap into my own feelings of suffering, empathy is going to be harder for me. And these are things that we can improve at over time. We can better recognize feelings in ourselves so that we can see them more quickly in others. We can practice perspective taking so that we see beyond our own lived circumstances. But if I haven't worked on something like empathy, then kindness gets harder. If I have, don't have the right tools in my toolbox, kindness gets harder. The second one's insecurity which is I can have lots of tools, but sometimes I'm afraid to employ them. <laughs> I Whether imagine that's because this is I'm... a big one, right? Absolutely. I think it's the, probably the biggest one and the most silent one. It's the one we least like to admit to, uh, of how pervasive our insecurities are, how ubiquitously our fears disrupt our capacity to care for ourselves and others. Whether that's our fear of rejection, what people think about us, being laughed at, being confronted, whether it's our fear of failure, failing myself, failing someone we care about, my fear of shame, 
which is sort of my own sense that I'm not enough. So how could I possibly help someone else feel safe or good in the world? Right, all of those different fears uh, drive us away from connection. And then the last category would be inconvenience, which I think would be probably the most, um, the, the river that runs through it, which is we're busy. We're always busy and there's never enough time. Uh, and unless we've created systems in our life to protect time properly, I would suggest that most of us will not prioritize kindness uh, in the same way that we prioritize a lot of other metrics of quote unquote success in our life. So to offer just the, the high level framework, those yeah. are the three things that I think about incompetence, insecurity, and inconvenience. So with those, I mean, one of the things that I love about your book is that you've, you've written it as a practical handbook. There are these beautiful stories that tug at our heartstrings that we can all relate to. So the Haiti story is a great example. The Sandy Hook story is a great example. Your mom putting post-its in your lunchbox is a great example. <laughs> And, and yet, like, so I guess what I love about it is that you've created this guide, like the subtitle of your book is a revolutionary guide for the way we think, talk and act in kindness. And so you not only tell us these stories and give us these frameworks, you give us some real actionable, like, here's how the hell you do this stuff so that we mm. can practice it. Because you've said the word practice a number of times, and I keep picking up on that going, that's it right? All of this stuff, any sort of mindset shift, any sort of cultural change is practice over and over and over again. Like we said, it's the little things, it's the building trust, it's the kind of building this muscle, so to speak, right? So what are some examples that you can offer us of how we start to practice what deep kindness versus confetti kindness and common kindness look like? Hmm. Yeah, let me, uh, let me see if I can offer one in each of the three big sort of categories. The first one, incompetence. Uh, one of the categories I talk about, one of the skills that I think all of us can improve upon is emotional regulation, which would be the idea of, do we know what we're feeling in any given moment? And when, we're, when circumstances outside of us cause us to feel big feelings, particularly negative or challenging feelings, resentment, anger, uh, frustration, jealousy, whatever that looks like, sadness, you probably know as well as I do, there are people who make us feel certain things that when we're feeling that way, it is harder to be kind to them. <laughs> so one of the skills that we can all cultivate is emotional regulation, meaning what are the tools that I have at my disposal when I'm feeling really big feelings to make sure that in the moment, I'm not acting simply based on my emotions, which for a lot of people, that's what runs their life. When I feel a thing, I do a thing. When I feel a thing, I do a thing. That practice uh, does not lend itself well to consistent, unconditional kindness. Mm -hmm. So one simple uh, practice or even a filter through which you could view the world, you could even try it for the next day or two, is anytime you see something that frustrates you, tr try to um, not focus on the behavior, but the feeling behind the behavior. Meaning instead of saying, this person's such a jerk for cutting me off, you might say, I wonder um, what they're in a rush for, or I, I know what it feels like to be in a hurry. When someone is sharp with us uh, or dismissive of us, I wonder if the reframe is, I know what it feels like to not feel heard. I know what it feels like to be passionate and wanna get my way. I think we have a hard time identifying with people's behaviors uh, when oftentimes those behaviors are things that we are equally guilty of in our life uh, and sometimes it's easier to associate ourselves to the feelings of someone and what drives their actions instead of the actions themselves. So just as a simple practice, right? A filter we can put things through that occasionally is helpful is to identify with the, uh, the feeling and not the behavior. Insecurity, when we're talking about uh, fears, I think one of the most um, powerful practices would be the art of self-reflection when it comes to fear. <laughs> Uh, and so a, a practical sort of like framework I might offer is, is my, is my fight bigger than my fear? Mm. Meaning have I articulated why I care about a thing clearly enough, whether that's in my own brain, whether that is to a friend or someone I trust, whether that's something I actually write down in the highest version of this, that is what we do. We write it down. 
have I written down, for example, why kindness matters to me so much? And you can even get very specific around this. Kindness to my spouse, kindness to my dad, who sometimes really frustrates me, kindness to my friend, best friend, whatever that dynamic is, especially an area you want to work on, articulating why that thing is important to you. And then asking yourself this question, is my fear bigger than my fight? Because if it is, then we are more often going to align our actions to the things that scare us. And that happens all the time if we're not paying close attention to the fight on the far side, right? The why we do things can really clearly inform how and when we do them. A simple example is my grandfather who um, a week before uh, he passed away from um, cancer, I got a chance to see him. And I knew it was the last time I was gonna get a chance to see him. I don't know if you've ever been in a high stakes situation like that, where mm -hmm. it's like, this is the last visit. And because I'm a person who spent the past decade thinking and talking about kindness, I put an unreasonable amount of pressure on myself to say and do the perfectly kind thing in a moment of consequence. I have a big fear of failure. So much so that in this final encounter with my grandpa, we ended up talking about motorcycles, which is not something I know much about. And I don't think either of us, <laughs> I know this is your background, but I did, my <laughs> grandpa and I did not know much about it. And I remember walking away thinking to myself, that wasn't good enough. And so I spent the next multiple days thinking about exactly the right way to say the exact right thing. And finally, it took me climbing to the top of a mountain, meditating and filming the video. Finally, I sent it off to my grandpa. And uh, by the time he received it, he was in a coma and he passed away. Uh, later that night and he never got a chance to see the video and I, I say all that to say this you know for so many of us when it comes to kindness we're so worried about not saying the right thing or doing the right thing that sometimes we won't do anything at all but our fear of failing someone we care about sometimes can be so great that it's bigger than the fight that we're fighting in the first place now is that actually true no but if I haven't clearly articulated it to myself well enough big enough then my fear is going to override my fight day in and day out. Last but not least is inconvenience, which is really a question of how we protect time, how we prioritize kindness in our life if we actually believe it's a priority. And a simple statement would be the things that we give our time to are the things that we value. For many of us, our calendars run our life. Do we have any protected time on the calendar? that is explicitly for those abstract things that we say we're about, whether it's gratitude or presence or compassion, whatever that thing is, for me, it's kindness, right? Do you put it on your calendar? Hmm. And do you articulate what you wanna use with that time? Maybe it is something specific and consistent and intentional. You alluded to my mom who wrote me a note in my lunchbox every day, kindergarten through 12th grade. And I think about how each of those days only took her like two or three minutes. But the aggregate, right, is the consistency over time that when I look back on it, I'm like, this is one of the most profound actions of love of my life. And you know what's funny is if you put that thing on your calendar, let's say it's at 8 a.m. or 3 p.m. And now when someone says, hey, do you have 3 p.m. available? You can say, no, I don't. And you know what I've discovered is no one ever says, oh, yeah, what, what do you have at 3? <laughs> no one ever questions it. You know, it's just for yourself. And uh, if our goal is simply to make ourselves busy for our whole life, that is very possible. But if we want to make ourselves busy and protect time to do the things that are, I think many of us would describe are the most meaningful components of our life, cultivating connection and relationships and purpose and meaning that requires just as much time and discipline as anything else. And so uh, the last one for inconvenience would be protect time literally on your calendar. I love it. Our calendars, like what's on our calendars says everything about what matters to us and what's important to us. So it's a beautiful example. So I, I'm going to ask you this question. What's something you're putting on your calendar now that maybe wasn't on your calendar a year ago or two years ago? Hmm. Well, I have a, a standing date with myself every day at 8 a.m. Uh, that is for reflection and connection. I usually use that to dance. That is my favorite form of self-care. Yes, dance uh, party. Yes, that's my favorite sort of like moving meditation. But uh, the other thing that I do every day is in our work channel, we have a to-do list and a to-be list. And so uh, every day I articulate what I have to do, still have work to do. 
But at the top of that list, I always write down one thing uh, that's on my to-be list. So literally today, if I were to pull it up, it is supportive. Uh, film three encouraging loom videos, like screenshot videos to help people do their work um, with more clarity and creativity. That was my goal today. So Love I it. wanted to be supportive of a team who are working on some new design things, and that's part of my background. So that's the way I articulated my to-be list today. Yesterday, it could have been celebratory. The day before that could have been grateful. The day before that, generous. And each day, I think, what is one five to 10 minute thing I could do to live into these things I say I want to be? I love the to be list. I talk a lot about being versus doing. So thank you for like, I'm like highlighting that one and underlining it for everybody who's listening, because what a powerful way for all of us to start our day. And I know you and I, like we could talk for hours and we've had to do this a couple of times. <laughs> so what I want to do is read something. You have so many powerful examples. Tell everybody to read the book. It's called Deep Kindness, A Revolutionary Guide for the Way We Think, Talk, and Act in Kindness. It is a practical guide, you guys, and there's so much goodness in here. I love how you talk about how we can be much more intentional and specific in the kindness that we offer to the people in our lives, to strangers. There's so much goodness. And you have some templates in there that we can use for people in our lives. And so I wrote one for you. And I want to end <laughs> with this one for you. So Houston, there's so much negativity in the world, but you have always been a bright light. I admire you so much for the for your courageous mission to make kindness normal, and I'm constantly inspired when I think of you doing hard work alongside the rest of us. The world needs way more kindness with a capital K and a whole lot more you. So thank you. Mm, thank you, Shelly. A pleasant way to end. I'll take that. I'm going to hang on to that one today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for offering those up. I've started using them in my life and they're really, really I mean, they're profound. They're so simple and yet so profound. So thank you for sharing your, your heart, your soul, your experience, your energy with us in the book and in this conversation really quickly, where can people find you now that they want to dive more into deep kindness and start practicing all this goodness? Yeah, uh, California, Venice, California, if you want to hang on person one of these days. Uh, otherwise, deepkindness.com for all things book and characterstrong.com for all things education. Those are my two worlds. And we can find you at Houston Craft because I know I follow you on Instagram as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Houston like the city, Craft like the cheese. Uh, <laughs> if you want to check it out on all the social platforms, I'm there too. I love it. We'll put it all in the show notes too. Thank you for spending this time. It's so good. I love when I am out in LA, which I will be soon, you know, I'm looking you up and we're going to hang out. In the meantime, thank you for doing much more than sprinkle kindness. Thank you for deeply embedding it in each of our lives. I'm grateful for you. I enjoy Shelly. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. Have a great day. Bye. Hey Rebel. Thanks for listening. If you were inspired by what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review so our fellow rebel souls can find us. We have big work to do together. And if you want to dive deeper, head on over to my website at soulbatical.com and follow me at soulbatical on Instagram. Until next time, stay bold, brave, and badass, and never stop asking, what am I rebelling for?